Good evening everyone and welcome to a stream at long last. We are back with some Toho Bossa Nova, some uh, gesture drawing. I have um, three different gesture drawing sessions queued up. One of them is about um, hands, the second one is about feet, and the, the third one is about faces. And after I have uh, run these sessions, I would again like to do a bit of an anatomy drawing on top of the last uh, gesture drawing, which in itself has um, 10 minutes allocated to it. It is a uh, quite a sunny day here on the Central European time zone. It is uh, over 30 degrees. There is a storm warning going on. And uh, I am glistening with sweat. And with that, let's start drawing. The first one is hands. Bit of a cat's claw thing going on. You might notice that I am using a uh, larger brush than I previously have. That is because I uh, I've been playing around and I noticed that um, larger brushes actually make it uh, somehow easier to, uh, to sketch. Mm, this is a dexterous pose, of course. Uh, that just makes it more difficult for me to draw. But perhaps um, more interesting as well. Through the last couple of uh, just drawing streams, I noticed that um, I got vastly more confident for the second time. Uh, this might be the case for you as uh, someone who might be self-conscious about gesture drawing as well. I, uh, I suggest just doing it. Uh, when you're doing it online, there's uh, basically no um, stress that you aren't making yourself. Because I am uh, excellent at stressing myself out. So this... Um, Information does not actually help me all that much, uh, but it might help you if you are the kind of person to uh, be persuaded by uh, rational arguments when it comes to being stressed out. I can barely see the fourth, fourth digit there. Well, anyway. The uh, 30 second poses are more than a bit um, too quick to actually make a, uh, a conscious effort on. I'm honestly um, quite happy with the uh, job that I'm doing here. I don't self-identify as an excellent uh, hand drawer, but uh, I don't hate doing it. It's actually um, I'm actually kind of having fun, and I imagine that's a uh, trying to find some way for you to have fun while drawing is probably the best way to actually keep you drawing. And of course, uh, keeping to it is the best way, one of the best ways, uh, or let's say perhaps one of the most important factors in learning how to draw if you cannot already. Um, I'm sure that there are actual um, factual differences between different uh, teaching methods. So just drawing as much as you can might not be optimal. But uh, you do have to draw a lot to practice. 
I'm not one of those people who think that um, everyone can do anything uh, as easily as anyone else. I think that's uh, not factually founded. It's certainly not factually founded for uh, languages. You know, see, there's uh, uh, sort of an unknown factor that it's called um, linguistic aptitude, where just some people have an easier time learning languages. You can uh, you get this result experimentally. Of course, the first explanations for this would be that. Uh, the usual suspects, that is, um, social class, um, parental valuation, that kind of thing. If you are a member of a slightly upper social class, you might get some uh, art education. Your parents might think that uh, drawing is um, valuable in itself, um, or in, even if they if they are not particularly interested in art, they might support you as a child being interested in art. And that kind of things um, account for a certain part of um, the achievement gap in a lot of uh, academic contexts. However, these can be controlled for as they are uh, known factors. Even once all of these things are controlled for, some individuals just have an easier time learning languages. They need to use a smaller amount of time to get the same result as uh, other members of their cohorts. I could easily imagine this being the case for art as well. I'm not an expert on that topic, but uh, I could easily see some people simply having an easier time and work less for the same result. Even in that case, if you have to work less for an easier uh, work less for the same result, that does not actually mean that. Uh, That the skills come for free. You might have heard of this uh, famous study that found that uh, master musicians all have about um, at least 10,000 hours of practice in. However, uh, the interpretation that the general public likes to make of this, that uh, it doesn't actually, that um, everyone actually has the same Capability. And if everyone were to put in 10,000 hours learning the violin, that anyone could become a master violinist with the same amount of effort. That's not what the result is. That might be true. As I already said, I don't have any actual information about this topic. But uh, I am not convinced that that is the case. So even if you are, even if you have a uh, an inherent advantage, you do have to work to take advantage of your of your advantage. Take advantage of your advantage. Yeah. I imagine that I have uh, quite a nice um, linguistic linguistic aptitude. There are tests for that. Uh, however, I have never taken part in any of these. However, I speak between um, 6 and 16 languages, depending on uh, how well you have to speak one to point it And that's not huge. You know, there are these uh, assholes who just learn a language in two weeks. I'm not one of those, unfortunately. Although, in my understanding, most of those people are also have a massive uh, institutional advantage. Uh, the one that I have heard about was uh, a professor of um, Uralic linguistics who already spoke 
most uh, Uralic languages, and uh, he managed to learn Baltic, um, the Baltic Finnic language spoken in uh, the area where St. Petersburg currently resides. Uh, this is an a moribund, almost dead language, as you could expect from a, uh, a minority language in an area with the historical capital and the current uh, city of millions. That kind of thing tends to happen. And this uh, professor managed to learn Baltic without making any sort of traditional effort. He just went to Ingria, the uh, region where St. Petersburg and uh, the boats were to be found. And he stayed there for a couple of weeks and um, he learned the language just listening to the people. Although, as I said, as this man already spoke, let's say at least 10, probably 15 Uralic languages, that doesn't mean that uh, just anyone could, would be able to do it. Even uh, someone with a uh, quite high um, linguistic aptitude. As you might know from other contexts, uh, kind of skills built on themselves. I have an easier time learning languages now than I did, uh, for example, as a teenager. I have better methods, I have um, a better, let's say, mental library to draw upon. For example, uh, I find uh, Japanese and Russian both relatively difficult uh, languages to learn, largely because out of the languages that I do know, they are outliers in the sense that I do not speak many or any uh, languages related to them. So I can't pull out of a uh, common vocabulary or grammatical library in the same way that I could, for example, for French, which I speak poorly. But uh, as I speak Latin, Spanish and uh, Italian, all of them relatively well, I am able to connect things that I learn about French into this milieu of grammar um, and vocabulary, which makes it, it makes it easy, easier to remember things, it makes it easier to conceptualize things. Of course, this is also the case for um, Sumerian, for example, as well. I cannot uh, draw upon any pre-existing information about uh, the Sumerian language. However, Sumerian as a dead language is uh, taught in uh, somewhat a different way. So my experience, this doesn't um, really come to question in the way that uh, trying to learn a language to the level that you can actually use it in uh, everyday life uh, works. I imagine that is um, this kind of mental libraries are also something that you build up with uh, with art. Um, some of you might be familiar with the kind of individuals who you know, just draw. They don't uh, sketch in anything the way that I do, for example. I'm very methodical in my drawing, as those of you who have watched the anatomy streams before this um, have certainly seen. However, even the people who can just draw, have to somehow have this information in their instinct. The other possibility is to just wing it, like um, Hirohiko Araki, for example, uh, is famous for never sketching. He's also famous for 
throwing the kinds of poses that are physically impossible for people to contort into. Uh, fortunately for him, this has become his um, aesthetic trademark. And as such, if anything, it seems to be a positive for him rather than a negative. I don't really have that kind of um, ability to draw from imagination without uh, constructing everything. Five minutes is getting to be um, surprisingly a lot for uh, hand drawing. I'm uh, more accustomed to doing. Uh, just uh, drawings of the entire body, so you have um, a lot more things to draw. I imagine I should um, stop making these quite so sketchy, less blocky, use, um, use more detail, but uh, that's something that I imagine I'd have to get uh, accustomed to over time. Anyway, um, you may have seen some demonstrations on YouTube, for example, of these artists who can just um, get an ink brush and just start drawing and produce uh, gorgeous, perhaps not flawless, but uh, certainly perfectly functional drawings without any sort of uh, apparent planning. And of course, um, I imagine that as a hobby hobbyist artist, this is the kind of work that we fantasize about, just being able to draw whatever you want. Whatever you wanted a picture of, you would like to just draw it. However, these are generally uh, professional artists who have been professional artists, not just drawing, but drawing daily, full time for money, for years, if not dec decades. Uh, the person that I am thinking of, um, has actually been a professional illustrator for more than 20 years. So of course this is not something that um, that is realistic as a, uh, as a hobbyist. You won't learn that in a couple of years, drawing maybe for a couple of hours per day. I think I'm bungling the, um, the proportions here. It looks horrible, but... Uh, just going back and forth the way I, I usually do um, for gesture drawings. I can't see where the problem is. It just looks bad. Who knows? This isn't the last uh, drawing anyway, so it's not a problem if it's bad. I just have to hope that um, I get a relatively friendly um, one for the next one. I keep, I keep um, getting distracted. I was talking something about these um, professional artists with their massive mental maps that they can just draw without, uh, apparently without thinking. I don't remember if I had anything, anything further to actually say about that. It's entirely possible that I said anything, everything that uh, I might want to. Who knows? Yes, um, that's a bungle. Five minutes on one hand is getting into enough time that I can actually start uh, erasing here. There's this one as well. This guy doesn't actually have a visible um, wrist tendon. If I recall correctly, there are actually uh, people who do not have that. It's a kind of, it's supposedly a kind of um, atavism, a kind of um, anatomical feature that no longer quite serves a purpose. Some people are just born without it in the people who do have it, like myself. 
it supposedly doesn't really do anything. Another possibility, of course, would be that this person is uh, uh, not quite lean. Um, he might have um, a bit of fat covering his wrist here. He doesn't look um, overweight to me, to be honest. So it might be this kind of um, disappearing anatomical feature. Who knows? So, um, if you are a poor enough artist to want to take uh, advice from me, I have a couple of bits of advice as we speak. One of them is to use um, a broad brush like I am now, or a broad pencil if you are drawing on uh, paper and pencil, which I uh, also suggest. It has certainly helped me um, draw more aggressively at times. Really, drawing a variety of things is probably one of the best things to do if you if you want to practice art. Don't just uh, focus on drawing uh, your waifu. Do different things. Draw landscapes, uh, buildings, animals, uh, basic geometric shapes, that kind of thing. This is the 10 minute one. So now I am going to make consciously make as good of an effort at uh, sketching this uh, man and woman shaking hands. They are quite venous. Um, I would interpret that they are aging individuals, perhaps not quite elderly, but uh, certainly middle-aged or older. But uh, whether or not that is the case, I can't really say. So, have the hands coming up something like this. We have the uh, pinky finger, goes off by its own a little bit. And there we mostly have the, um, the woman's hand blocked in. Then we need the man's hand. And this one has a bit of an extreme angle. Uh, this is the kind of situation where the kind of um i don't need to use colors for these this is the kind of situation where using architecture methodology comes in at least for me i might have um i'm not quite sure if i've mentioned this in a previous stream, but when I was young, I wanted to be an architect. But it did not happen. Um, as you know, I'm not an architect. Uh, the, the way that I um, start drawing architectural drawings is um, looking for, let's say, um, the heights kind of um, relative positions of things in the uh, in the view. And that is uh, is a method that I have found useful for gesture drawing as well. The beads of the fingers that come behind the uh, the woman's fingers are not that important, honestly. So here, that's um, an example of how learning to draw something can help you with something else. In this case, um, architecture drawings can help you with uh, gesture drawings, which I imagine in turn would... Uh, well, actually, this kind of practice, I think, would uh, help you immensely with um, drawing from reference, which is something that I have been doing recently. 
it is certainly much easier than uh, trying to always draw from uh, from imagination. It's certainly for someone like myself who likes to imagine extremely um, dramatic poses and uh, camera angles. Making a conscious effort to avoid drawing from uh, imagination has been uh, quite helpful. If you if you just want, um, let's say, uh, I think draftsman is the um, the English word for this. Back in the good old days, uh, there used to be. Uh, professional illustrators who were technically not artists they would uh, illustrate for technical drawings or what else advertisements that kind of thing so they didn't have a real creative input but they were drawing for a living a number of um, master artists worked as draftsmen for some uh, years in their life as well. For example, the uh, the favorite uh, Art Nouveau artists or artist of all teenagers, Alphonse Mucha, for example, uh, worked as a draftsman for some periods in his life. Uh, if you go to the uh, Mucha Museum in Prague, Mucha was a uh, Czech, uh, you will be able to find some of his um, you know, entirely commercial work. Mucha is of course uh, well known for his, um, perhaps best known for his advertisement graphics that are of course in their own way a sort of, certain kind of uh, commercial art. You could think of this as a form of uh, draftsmanship. Although it seems that uh, Mucha himself at least did not uh, see it this way and uh, the mu museum certainly doesn't uh, conceptualize it them in the same way. As is my understanding, um, this kind of advertisement poster artists had uh, a certain degree of artistic freedom to their works and in this case it would be um, fundamentally different from uh, the kind of mechanical drawing that um, technical uh, draftsmen would do. So by this point I have actually penciled in everything. At this point I am going to start throwing in some of the dependence on this woman. I still have three minutes to go, which is actually quite a lot. Surprisingly lot, actually. Oh. Maybe I can actually do some shading here. That might be interesting as well. We have some um, vague shadows running down here along the tendon of the index finger and left of that everything is in at least mild shadow there is another maximal shadow here around the uh, base of the thumb and a sort of um, an edge of darkness along here on the far, far side from the light uh, the top light is, is somewhere around here. 
Then we have some shadows on the man's hands. His middle two fingers are well shaded. But his top finger is actually not all that shady. And then the base of his thumb again has um, a large diffuse shadowy area with some maximal shadows here and here. Then let's uh, combine these into these into the shadows a little bit. There's actually very little shadow in this um, in this photo. I imagine that uh, it has been deliberately lit in that way. Although, even though I worked as a um, gesture drawing model as a student, I never involved myself with the lighting. So, what kind of things are sought for for this kind of artistic lighting? I can tell you. I can imagine that they would like to. Um, strengthen some of the contours, but uh, how exactly, I unfortunately don't know. I don't know how to do a good job exaggerating the contours on uh, human hands with lighting. I just don't know how to do it. I can't really analyze it, even when I see it myself. So, there we have uh, the 10 minutes. Hello, big the the eight. The uh, amount of facets that you have uh, seems to change on a regular basis. So let's start putting these, uh, turning these down, and then I will start a new group for the anatomy portion. And pour myself a little bit of water. There's, um, there's likely someone here who wasn't here half an hour ago. It is uh, quite warm and quite sunny where I live. And uh, honestly, I feel halfway uh, dehydrated speaking to you. It certainly somehow feels much worse than it usually does. All right, so what kind of bones do we have in the hands? Well, remember that the forearm has two bones. One of them is quite robust and starts in the middle of the elbow and comes to the bottom part of the, of the wrist. However, this bone is actually quite gracile when it arrives at the wrist. So you actually uh, want to draw a kind of a, a small uh, rounded bone at this point. Um, I probably should draw this at the um, the bulge of this lady's wrist here. I think that the, the bulge is in, in fact caused by the uh, By this bone. And then there is the other forearm bone, the one that starts off um, being quite gracile at the outside of the elbow, but this one becomes quite large by the time it arrives at the wrist. So the forearm bones kind of um, switch places. Or switch roles. The massive one becomes uh, small and the small one becomes massive when they arrive at the wrist. Here you should remember that the bone that rotates is this uh, 
one that I have drawn in red. So if you pronate or supinate your hand, that means turn the palm up or down, the bone that is um, rotating to let this happen is this red one. That can be quite useful if you are uh, stuck drawing some difficult um, angles, as, uh, as I often find myself, and I imagine as uh, if you are interested in drawing, you might find yourself in that position as well. So then, the next one are going to be the raised bones. And the raised bones, there are about 15 or 20 of them, um, an uncomfortable amount. So instead of actually drawing them in as individual bones, I like to draw them in as a sort of abstract mass. I find that that's uh, much more helpful. You might want to do this as well. And in particular, if you draw them as this kind of um, rounded puck, like the half of um, an ice hockey puck, uh, this helps you think of the way that the that the wrist actually articulates. Uh, it can move in all cardinal directions, true, but um, considering the cardinal direction separately, I think is uh, helpful to working through whether or not the rotation that you are you are trying to draw is actually possible. Again, of course, if you are rocket for a rocket, or one of those people who think that uh, you don't need to make possible poses for any reason, you can just feel free right, to ignore this advice. But uh, I imagine if you are either extremely confident in your artistry, or much better at drawing than I am, you are probably not going to be listening to my, my advice anyway. So then, the next phase are the, I think these are called phalanges. These are the uh, first finger bones. These exist inside of the, inside of the hand. And they come up to around here. So you might notice that there is an area around the knuckle that is actually already the first finger bone. Well, once we get to that, I'll I'll talk more, talk more about that. It's actually uh, I think it's quite an interesting topic. You actually want to partition out uh, five bones that start at the um, the puck here. One of them is the uh, thumb bone. In this case, um, well, the thumb bone is about uh, two-thirds of the length of the palm bones, let's say. However, in this angle, the, palm bo uh, the first thumb bone is actually uh, turned in a different direction than the uh, palm bones are. So visually, they appear to have the same length. So they have the same uh, angular length in our eye or this imaginary camera. However, it is uh, in fact longer. I guess it should be. Well, I'm going to go with the, uh, with the sketch that I have. It's going to be good enough. So, we end up having four of these finger bones inside the palm. Again, remember that they do not go all the way to the knuckle. The knuckle is already where the first finger bone starts. These also carry tendons. So if you have a, um, if you are particularly lean yourself, or if you are drawing from photo reference of someone who is quite um, thin and muscular, or if you are 
imagining some kind of a superhero or that kind of character. You might want um, to have lines on the outside uh, following these bones. And then the fifth, the fifth bone is the uh, thumb bone. And then I am going to do the same on the other side. I think partition like this is going to work well enough. You can see that we want the thumb bone to come up around here, pointing away from us. If you want to use these kind of um, contour lines, um, the way that I did it here, that I started uh, having them curve on this side and then cross over and curve on the other side. As uh, in this case, I don't think we, if there actually was a cylinder like this, we wouldn't be able to see either end of it. They would both be turned away from us. So, then, here we get to the, um, the finger thing. So, you see the meat, the line of the meat here? This is nowhere near to where the, um, the palm bones end up. This is actually the halfway point of the first finger bone. This is uh, something that is good to remember. So we are going to draw our palm bones definitely inside the palm from this uh, point of view. Uh, then let's uh, start getting into the finger bones. I'm going to uh, switch to blue for these. There are, in fact, uh, three finger bones. If you think of the length of the palm bone, the fingers are going to be all together about the same length. And then within uh, the fingers, you can divide them into halves and then halves. Uh, so if you are using the um, the ball method that I, uh, I I personally use to measure things, uh, you would have half a ball for the palm, half a ball for the uh, fingers. However, the thing is that um, the way that the bones inside the hand work and the way that the hand appears on the outside are not the same. We get into the meat here again. Uh, so this is where the knuckle is. This is where the actual bone switches from the palm bone into the finger bone. This is where the knuckle is. So when you rotate your hand, the pivot point is here. So you end up with something like this. And this here is actually what the knuckle is. It is not the end of the palm bone, it is uh, the beginning of the finger bone. And in addition, the meat is, uh, comes down like this. And the meat starts at the knuckle. But uh, when you come to the palma, palm side, it actually comes up to the halfway point of the first bone. And this edge of the meat is actually what we see here, as I uh, alluded to earlier. This is something to, uh, to remember. I think that uh, if you keep this in mind and think about it, 
maybe throw it out on the side like this when you are drawing yourself if you are if you are feeling confused just throw something in um, in the in profile as a kind of uh, you know technical blueprints for yourself it will help you think about it um i should do more of this myself honestly um when i am when when i want to make a high effort i do this for both um uh, clothes and uh, camera angles but uh, let's get into that at some point in the future i think so here we have the first um, finger bones and on the other side the meat will come to somewhere around here and the first finger bones will end around here Here it is useful to remember that the hand has a sort of a sort of a fan with the fingers. Um, usually the middle finger is the lo longest one, whether or not the index finger or the ring finger is the second longest one, depends. On a statistical scale for entire populations, uh, men are more likely to have the uh, have a longer ring finger and women are more lo likely to have a longer index finger but uh, as i think i told you before the distributions are something like this so if you draw them the same length for everyone that's that's, that's going to be just fine not a problem at all and the thumb when it is uh, flat against the hand uh, usually comes up to the um, the first knot to the knuckle. The thumb as well um, has the um, the first bone inside. Uh, this is much more mobile than the uh, palm bones. But then you have the practically the same length again cut in half. For the parts of the thumb that you can actually see articulate here we have the first of course the first knuckle and the lady's first knuckle is going to be somewhere around here You could conceivably just um, draw these as a sort of a series of um, lines, like a, a stickman hand, and then um, just add the meat. This is probably uh, well enough for distance shots, but uh, since we are doing a kind of uh, a detailed drawing here, let's not uh, go the easy way. All right, so at this point, uh, we are down to the second finger bones switch to red again for the um, for the thumb there is only one of these for the other fingers there will be two i'm going to use uh, color contrast again to remind you a bit of the positions of these and then blue for the for the final bones. This is what the bones in the hand end up looking like. It seems intimidating, but uh, it's not impossible to successfully draw hands 
um, in an analytical method like this without um, just throwing hands for hours and hours and hours not knowing what you are actually doing. Um, the way that a lot of advice for beginning artists is, I think this is um, a problem of people who actually have learned to draw, draw like that. Um, partially, of course, they will teach you how to, how they did it, but uh, this is not necessarily the best way to learn it. And of course, then there's, there are the uh, Argo cultist individuals who uh, think that more effort directly translates into more progress. Of course, this is not the case. There are better and there are worse methods of learning. More effort is better than less effort, but uh, less effort directed in a better way can easily be better than a larger amount of effort put to use in a, in a worse way. Uh, using languages as an example again, uh, the way that um, many people attempt to learn vocabulary, for example, is reading through these kinds of vocabulary lists. It just doesn't work. You are basically wasting your time. If you are learning a language course, for example, and you have these vocabulary lists that you want to or have to learn, learn them in the flashcards. This is exactly the kind of uh, use case that flashcards are perfect for. Uh, not only the method of um, spaced repetition, spaced repetition works for everything. Thing is that uh, using flashcard software for other kinds of um, learning other than vocabulary takes more effort and intelligence from the learner. And unfortunately, uh, particularly when it comes to this kind of uh, self-help gurus on YouTube, they unfortunately do not necessarily have either the education or the intelligence to be talking about what they are talking about. I've seen many of them uh, talk smack about, uh, for example, Anki, the popular uh, flashcard software, without actually understanding anything about what they are supposed to do. This would be like um, not reading the manual to a technical device and then complaining that you can't use the remote not something that uh, would endear you to anyone who actually knows anything about the topic. But uh, in my opinion, or my experience, the kind of uncles and grandpas who cannot figure out um, remote controls generally aren't the ones uh, pretending to be experts on the topic, fortunately. So here we are done with the bones. Let's turn that... Um, Turn the opacity on all of these down a little bit and then look at the the bow um, the meat what kind of meat do we want to draw in a hand um there are basically two larger muscles or muscle groups that uh, occur in the hand the um the muscles that control the long fingers are all situated within the uh, within the forearm. So if you make a fist, for example, and look at your forearm, if you are either muscular or thin enough, you will see the, uh, the muscles rippling quite far up in your forearm, almost at the elbow. So that is where the uh, muscles that operate the long fingers Ah, where you do have muscles in the hand is the thumb, as this has to be rotated towards the inside and outside of the hand. And for this reason, we have sort of a cotton muscle on the outside of the thumb. So this does not actually uh, build up that much muscle or mass in the hand. However, On the palm side, you actually do have a massive muscle. This attaches to 
the base of the first bone of the first finger bone of the thumb and to the wrist here so you have um, a mus muscular mass something like this this ends up being almost identical with the uh, fleshy mass that we sketched in the uh, beginning in the chest drawing at the beginning so when it comes to muscles basically you are done with these ones and of course you have the curtain muscle here on the other side but uh, it's difficult to see from this angle other than that most of the fleshy mass in the hand is actually fat there are there's one very large fat pad in the hand and that is along the uh, the small finger it ends up attaching something like this this is again um, basically identical with the bottom of the form so if you karate chop someone you are hitting them with this uh, this fat 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 This is again, this uh, would be somewhere around here for the other side, but um, it's not really visible. And then, perhaps the most troublesome of the meat of the hand is uh, the meat between the knuckles. And this is actually also what makes uh, getting well fitted, or what makes well fitted gloves sit so well on your hands. Uh, I have a couple of pairs of actual high quality leather gloves and they have this angle built into them whereas uh, cheap gloves will just have a straight construction like this you of course save money in doing that but uh, you end up with a, an inferior product so this meat we start at the um, the contact of the palm bones and the first finger bones. So out here. And then this moves towards the halfway point of the first finger bones. So that would be around here. And of course, here, where the uh, where we already draw the form line in the gesture drawing. So what we end up with is an angled plane that uh, will actually fit the traces of the um the traces between the fingers quite well so if you are having trouble understanding where the traces uh, at the start of the finger come in just draw this uh, this fat pad in and then you will know so i think that's uh, about enough for the hands with this we are done with the um first gesture session i think i'm going to take uh, faces next because um, with the heat i'm uh, i might be uh, dissuaded from going three hours as planned again a bit of water I hope it's just the um, heat exhaustion and uh, dehydration that are making my throat feel weird I don't really have any sort of uh, warm-up routine or method for taking care of my voice. I guess I have uh, have a good enough instinct for how to um, keep my voice in order. However, it doesn't seem to be working today. Maybe it's just uh, an effect of uh, taking a pause for a couple of weeks. Who knows? But uh, I think. After hands, uh, faces will be the next most interesting one.
we can spare the hands for now. Uh, I mean, um, we can spare the feet for now. I'm sure there's um, someone in the audience who would absolutely uh, love to see me um, throwing women's hands at women's feet. But uh, another time, perhaps. Either later today or another time. So, there's a picture of water down my palette. Let's get to work on faces. There's a beer dome. I'm going to bungle the uh, proportions here a little bit. Yes, definitely. Oh well, no matter. Mm. This is um, a difficult face to draw, I would say. It's um, very first lips. Um, imagine a middle-aged woman doing the um, the pork chop face, and that's uh, that's what you have. I'm really struggling with the proportions for faces. Well, that's um, a sign that I should be doing more uh, gesture drawings of faces. I think this, um, this lady might be perturbed, perhaps uh, confused. I could um, imagine someone making a face like this even uh, if they are having fun, but uh, who knows? Bit of a hook nose there. Ah, this time just looking off to the side. Nothing difficult here. Again, um, a bit of a younger woman this time. Using this kind of massive brush for uh, faces might be a bit uh, too much. It certainly keeps me um, drawing aggressive, but uh, whether or not the the effect is um, is what we would wish for is uh, is a different question, and uh, it is not necessarily the case. Well, who cares? is uh, looking a bit like Baron von Munchausen, uh, the famous lawyer. I enjoyed his book um, when I was young. I haven't read it in decades, so I can't say uh, if I would still recommend it, but uh, it's a classic. You can probably find it in the library. Oh, it's probably old enough that uh, if you speak a major language, you might be able to find it just on, uh, on the internet for free. Oh, an extreme pose this time. This man is looking quite a bit down.
This man is also looking down, although not quite uh, as extreme as the last one. Thirty seconds is quite little for a face, I find. Well, of course it's quite little for anything, but uh, perhaps I'm somehow accustomed to the other kinds of gesture drawings by now. Certainly the, the hands uh, didn't seem all that stressful for me. This time the man is looking slightly up. It's going to make uh, drawing his nose quite difficult, I fear. Well, good enough for which work? I've learned to be extremely aggressive with this kind of drawings. And being extremely ag aggressive is always a um, good thing to learn when it comes to drawing. If you make mistakes confidently, um, you will notice them more easily than if you are keeping things vague to avoid making mistakes. When you boldly make a mistake, you make it uh, easier on yourself to notice that you have made a mistake. And that makes it, of course, easier easier for you to correct it. There's nothing wrong with bungling things. The problems start when you don't notice that you have bungled something. You can always um, always erase. Well, of course you can't when you're doing uh, gesture drawing, but um, in principle you can always um, erase. No reason to torture yourself when you are just uh, drawing for fun. Unfortunately, um, as you know, I have a massive propensity for torturing myself with uh, extreme angles and that kind of thing. Yeah, I think if you if you want to um, just draw for fun, you have to learn to. You know, take the take the easy way once in a while. That's something that I uh, I struggle with. I I almost always overextend unless I am uh, drawing from reference. And of course, uh, that just means that for me, drawing from reference uh, is something that I should be doing more. And perhaps I could, I would be able to uh, teach myself to take it a bit easier, even when I am drawing from imagination. It would certainly be a useful skill for me. This person is uh, somewhat frowning, I think. Certainly moving their um, moving 
their eyebrows. It had a, quite a cartilaginous nose, but, um, something to pay attention to when you are looking at people. This guy is scrunching his nose up quite a bit. I'm actually going to concentrate on that. That's actually quite an interesting touch of, you know, um, of the face. Then a relatively slender nose. Now we are up to five minutes. Mostly a head on pose, but um, making a bit of a face. Face is slightly upturned. Upturned faces are something that um, that are difficult to draw. Um, part of the phenomenon at play is that um, there are these hanging bits of the neck. So when you are looking up at someone, there isn't uh, the kind of beautiful um, curve. Um, we love to idealize on drawings. I mentioned um, Yoshikazu something a couple of times by now, probably the artist for uh, Tsukumomo. He's someone who loves to draw in uh, sketch. You can see some of his. Uh, Sketches on Pixie on his Pixie page, uh, where you can see that he has uh, gone to a, a substantial effort in order to uh, get the anatomy right on his characters. Uh, I recommend looking him up. If I remember, I will link his uh, his Pixie in the chat at the end. If I don't. Uh, you can just Google Tsukumomo and you will be able to find his name and um, probably his Twitter, probably his Pixiv, all sorts of things. So now we are at the hmm. yeah, this is probably the um the parceling that I actually want here. However, once again, she is looking slightly up, making it difficult. I was going to praise uh, Yoshikazu something again, but uh, I got sidetracked and I don't remember what for. Well, he is a great artist. And certainly a method man such as myself, so... Um, looking into his works um, or his, his works in process, his uh, sketches uh, might be useful to any of you who are trying to learn from him as well. I think this face would have been uh, quite good for the uh, final pose. If the final pose ends up being uh, bad, I guess I'll just uh, come back to this one. There's enough uh, movement here that there's actually something to think about. And the, the pose is 
relatively easy. I have a minute to go. I'm going to start um, erasing for the Something that I um, often catch myself um, not doing a good enough job at is uh, uh, extremes. Although I enjoy torturing myself with extreme poses, I often do not draw them extreme enough. This is something that uh, I would recommend you pay attention to and uh, correct while you still can. This is actually was happening to me in this case as well. The um, screen right part of her face was uh, not being pulled enough, although it uh, it should have been as she is making a face. So I just uh, you know erased that and did it again. Another extreme pose here. Here we have the chin again. Oh yeah, what I wanted to talk about um, Yoshikazu something was uh, what he does with the chins, the chin line. Um, he is a comic artist, as you might know or might have been able to um, realize from the fact that he draws something uh, with a Japanese title. And what he does is that uh, he doesn't draw the actual jawline like this and the perhaps not quite um, as aesthetically pleasing uh, joint here between the uh, the hanging meat and the mandible and instead what he does is um, he just draws a um, an attractive line here ignoring the anatomy to make it look better and I have to agree that it looks gorgeous he does an amazing job at uh, doing these kind of fake fake angles if you have heard someone talk about um, knowing the rules so you know how to and when to break them I think this is um, this is a perfect case of this so Yoshikazu something is clearly extremely methodical. He is great at drawing. He knows exactly what he should do to be realistic. However, he knows even better what he should do to look beautiful. And that is what he does. That is something uh, that as a hobbyist illustrator I imagine um, anyone watching this for tips and tricks on how to draw um, could take use of as well. Here I'm starting to draw in some of the uh, structure of the face instead of just drawing from sight because this is, uh, this is a difficult pose and I am finally having enough time with the 30 second uh, drawings it is just plain impossible to do this kind of uh, construction on gestures maybe erase a bit of that um, there is a line running like this, but uh, the contrast, of course, is not nearly as strong as it is with the outside of the neck. So we might not actually want to draw it uh, quite as dark. When it comes to line weights or the darkness or the um, thickness of lines, there are a number of things that you can communicate with them. Uh, one, of course, if you are particularly uh, cartoony, because you are drawing, uh, you might want um, 
because we have the extreme outline be thicker than any other outline. That is uh, quite aesthetically pleasing. And uh, it has actually been used in some, uh, you know, early modernist uh, fine art as well. So it's not just something for modern cartoonists. Another thing would be the way that I am using it. So that when the line is weaker, that means that the contra color contrast or the structure in general is weaker as well. Another one would be distance. You might want to draw things that are further away from the viewport viewpoint, as um, as lighter or with um, thinner lines. Something you could do as well. Um, what else? I'm sure there are, there's a number of things you could do that I'm not immediately thinking of here. And that was uh, five minutes. Here we have a bit of an extreme pose for the last one, but not too much. I think this will suit me just fine. If you are doing line art or black and white drawing, you might, uh, um, of course, use the darkness as uh, actual darkness. But that's a bit of a trivial case. You probably know, don't need uh, need to tell you that you can use uh, darkness in a drawing to mark darkness. It has a bit of a brow ridge here. Uh, women in general have uh, more gracile brow ridges than men, but uh, that does not mean that they have none. That it is. Um, if you are drawing from life or photos or realistic imaginary characters, I think it will serve you well to remember this kind of uh, generalizations are not never absolute. You don't want to draw or a woman draw, looking like Nikolai Valuyev, for example, um, a boxer with an extremely pronounced brow ridge. However, you might want to draw them with something of a brow ridge. Depends on what you want to do, of course. This lady appears um, surprised and alarmed. She has a scrunched up nose as well. And she has a little bit of cartilage here. The cartilage is something that we will get to when I get to the um, the anatomy part here. The cartilage of the nose is actually something that you can easily used to uh, differentiate between uh, imaginary character designs if you are drawing characters detailed enough to actually have visible nasal cartilage it's not necessarily the case in these um, social circles particularly uh, many people will want to draw extremely gracile waifus might not uh, actually display a lot of the anatomical structures present in human beings. However, if you want to, it can be a good method. I think I've um, bungled this a bit. If uh, the cartilage comes almost directly after the eyes, which are in themselves. Around here. She has droopy eyelids. This can be something for 
um, you can use as a character design element as well. The tip of her nose is at the level of her pupil. So this is the kind of uh, architecture methods that I was talking about earlier. That I, uh, I find useful for gesture drawing as well as architecture drawing that I would uh, suggest to you as well. At least try it. I don't think um, the other nostril will be visible from this angle at all, unfortunately. I would like to draw it in, but uh, I don't think that will be possible. Her cheek meat. Just a bit of a curve here. Um, where the mouth comes in. So let's draw that in. And her stage, her left side of the mouth is pulled up. This is going to be something relatively difficult for me to actually capture. But um, I'm doing my best. It doesn't really have a particularly visible um, nostril meat on this side. I'm going to slightly pencil it in. Of course, it is there. The thing is just that I uh, can't really do a good, good job identifying it. Then we have some teeth. Sometimes when you see people um, draw people, they will draw an absurd amount of teeth, particularly on the in the bottom row. I don't know why they would do this, um, but uh, you shouldn't. It looks it, it looks downright silly. Right, I think the face is more or less there. There's some hair, of course. Bit of a gap here. And then the shoulders curve away relatively high up. So she is either lifting her shoulders or she made a bit of a funny funny angle for the um, for the camera. Here, there's some shadow here. It's going to be some kind of a shadow around the um, the eye eye holes. I have uh, two minutes remaining. Shouldn't be much of a problem. Of course, this is a situation where I cannot absolutely cannot um, make fine adjustments with this brush so this uh, differentiation between it's a trade-off between uh, kind of a useful aggression that um, large brushes is still in you and uh, you trade away some ability to work in detail when you are using a large brush such as this. Of course, when you are not um, gesture drawing, 
and you have plenty of time, there isn't actually any reason to not switch between um, rush sizes. Can I improve this somehow with this brush size? I'm not convinced of that. I'm going to try to mark in something here. I think this uh, this line here comes um, partially from her orbital bone, partially from the muscles controlling her eyebrows. Uh, what else do we have? A bit of um, a chin separation here. The other side of her neck, somewhere around here. Uh, I think that's probably going to be it. Um, 15 seconds remaining. I don't think it uh, makes much sense to keep going with this. So, let's start uh, throwing in some anatomy on top of this. What might you want to begin with? Well, from the previous uh, stream, some of you might remember that I like this um, ball drawing method with some cutouts. Of course, you have to imagine one on this side. We see that she is um, facing relatively squarely at us. So you can Add these um, helping lines um, almost uh, perpendicular. Then you want to connect them. And find the mid midpoints of the connecting lines. That is where you would like to have your um, the center line of your face. This has not um, quite happened in this case. Ah, you know what? The uh, reason is that, of course, since she is looking uh, slightly away from us, we end up with a bit of perspective here. So we don't actually want to have our visual uh, median line for this. That would be visually be somewhere around here, but um, actually it would land, land somewhere around here. And this actually ends up lining with the center line of the face quite well. Uh, at this point you might have noticed that I have um, partitioned the upper and central face into two parts. I would like a third one with about uh, the same separation further below here. You will see that this is um, a bit of a scaling error here. This uh, lowest line here should be at the chin and the highest line should be at the hairline. So I think what has actually happened here is that I have in fact tried to cut away a much too small portion of this, um, this ball. The height of this cut away should be two thirds. Let's try again. See if we can get this to match. Let's let us cheat a little bit. We know that we want one line at the um, hairline here, and we want one at the uh, at the nose here. So actually, what we end up cutting away ends up being an area like this. But it looks much better, much better. And of course, this is um, this can be a, a source of um, errors for you as well. So this might actually be a case of that um, problem where I have um, difficulties uh, being extreme enough. 
is uh, conceivable. And in this case, I managed to more or less um, fix the situation by just drawing it again. If you are practicing something that you are not familiar with, you might want to uh, try and try again, even if you do not notice what you are doing wrong. Keep a copy hidden, draw the same thing again, compare the two, and see what has changed. That might be something useful. All right, so at this point, we have our chin line around where we want it. We have our hairline around where we want it. Then let us um, start drawing our um, our cheekbones. They work something like this. You will notice that they they match the uh, the sketch relatively well. This is of course partially because uh, I am cheating and I have the um, sketch here in the background, but that is not the only only reason for it. The other reason is that these kind of um, abstractions are actually based on relatively universal parts of the human anatomy. So then above the uh, the cheekbone bone, we start to have the, um, the skull. And we have the, um, the mandible begins at the, uh, the bottom of this cutaway here. Probably want some kind of, uh, you know, nick here. A bit of curve to it. Uh, if you just draw it straight, it's going to look weird. Um, if you are drawing a particularly macho man, you might want uh, this kind of, kind of almost a recurve. For example, uh, I think my bone, I think my jaw bone has a recurve like this, but uh, once you get the meat on top of it, it's no longer visible. Then for the rest of the head, you mostly want to follow the, the ball that we established at the beginning. And then we have the neck, which attaches to the base of the skull. And the base of the skull is at the level of these uh, bottom points of the cutaway. We want to have the, the neck attaching around here. Uh, this is something that's difficult to um, make use of when you are drawing extremely um, stylized characters. Humans actually have um, relatively robust necks. Your wife who might not, or you might not want to draw her having a, um, a robust neck. But let's, uh, let's actually sketch in a little bit of how the uh, um, or the collarbones might run here. You have the tendons that come to the collarbone. This one is being pulled a little bit straight as she is looking in the other direction. The opposite one is going to curve, but that is mostly not going to be visible because it is behind her chin. So there we have the. Uh, the absolute minimum of a, um, of a skull form. So uh, we have these hel helping lines here. I'm going to start a new layer. Let's use red this time. The top of these is the hairline. So below that is uh, basically um, the forehead. Uh, the second one would be the um, ideally the uh, brow ridge. So you would like to have a um, brow ridge something like this. This is where the correspondence between the sketch and the anatomic part here starts breaking up. It might well be that I have simply bungled the um, gesture drawing, that is always possible. 
so as a result of that, I'm going to just draw this as if this uh, construction method was, uh, if, as if the constructed phase was the correct one. So we have the power edge here, and we have um, a bit of draw before we have the cheekbone. So we have to change our radius drawing here a little bit. But not that much. Almost immediately, so that the bridge comes back again as well, and once it comes back, the structure of the nose begins to rise from the face. The first part of the nose is actual bone. This is a bone. I'm going to actually. Turn the um, the sketch here off. It's uh, tripping me out, honestly. So this part is bone, and it has a bit of um, a bit of structure, of course. And then either side of this nose structure, we have the eye holes. This is something that will again be difficult to reconcile between actual human anatomy and uh, drawing waifus, as I imagine many of you would like to. But uh, it's not impossible. This one is going to be about half the uh, height of this. Um, Half cutaway here. This also this is also where the um, ear comes in. So the eye hole is about half of the height of the ear. That can be a useful um, rule of thumb for you. So what we have after that, we have. Um, We have a hole in this in the skull. You can use the um, the bottom help helpline here, and then after that uh, we start getting into the teeth. Uh, the teeth area is about one half of the remaining area, and the bottom half is uh, the chin. The teeth are slightly bulged out so you might want to imagine a sort of um, sort of cylinder here thing is of course that the teeth also turn inwards behind this this is something that is um, that i always find extremely difficult to actually draw but uh, having some kind of uh, you know, volume here to remind you where this thing might, may, where you might want to draw this can be um, helpful. So then, what else do we want on the skull itself? Well, not necessarily all that much. If you actually want to um, draw the skull, Instead of a, a finished person, you might want to draw in here, and you might want to draw in the, uh, the actual separation between the mandible, but uh, it's probably not necessary. So, uh, the next one concerns the nose, and this, um, this can be quite helpful. So when you have the bones of the nose, um, the second thing you might want to draw in are the cartilages of the bone uh, of the nose. There are two of these. I think I have drawn my nose a little bit. The angle here is a little bit uh, shallow. That looks better. Um, you can just touch your face and. Uh, Check at which um, relative heights these 
things are in relation to each other. Again, um, if you are lean enough or muscular enough, you can also use your own body to um, check where, how, which uh, muscles rotate, where things attach, that kind of thing. Anyway, there are going to be two parts with cartilage on the nose. The first one is the one where So here, at the um, at the point where the bone and the cartilage um, come together, uh, this is where you get that kind of um, double curve in the nose for those who have that. This woman had a very slight um, double curve here, I think, but uh, let's ignore it for now. Here we can attach this to the bottom of the bone and then we want some more cartilage but this is this is where the actual tip of the nose comes in the uh, the nostrils and the bulb of the nose the bulb of the nose actually has five planes to it and after that Um, turns back to attach just above uh, where, where the teeth begin. So this is the point where you would have to start fighting with the nostrils. The nostrils are difficult to draw. I don't really have any particularly good methods for them. What we have is that they attach around here and of course that um, they are curved. So you might want uh, to draw in the inside of the nostril curve and then just a curve from the um, joint between the two cartilage sections this this might be good enough for whatever you want to do hopefully it is so after that um, what do we want to do actually at this point let's um, Pull up the the drawing to remember. Remember what we uh, actually want to have here. We want to have some um, fairly droopy um, eyelids. So let's think about. Throwing some droopy eyelids. The uh, the eyeball itself is going to be inside the eye hole, of course, so it cannot be massively larger than the eye hole. But of course, part of it will be obscured by parts of the skull. The area of the eye that we actually see is quite small. So, what else do we want? At this point, we might. Um, we are already thinking about the eyelid, which hangs uh, for this person hangs down. So let us actually. Oh, hello, Caleb. Welcome. You were doing some sports as well. I noticed earlier. I also did some sports today, although not quite as intensive as you might have, as I imagine you did. Oh, thank you, Pete. Um, I have some swingy tunes running in the background, and I have um, I've been doing some gesture drawing today. We did um, one with uh, hands that was actually relatively low stress, quite fun. And now we are working on a face. I already did half an hour of gesture drawings for faces, and now I am talking about the anatomy of a human head based on uh, the final uh, gesture drawing that I did. At this point I am mostly done with the skull 
So here the uh, the nose already has all his cartilage and meat. And now I am moving towards the eyes. Uh, don't worry, Caleb. I'm sure you need uh, quite a lot of recuper recuperation afterwards. Um, did you do your planks? I have to ask you. Did they hold you to your word? Ah, oh, two minutes. That's quite long. I don't think I've ever ever been able to do two minutes. I think something like uh, 90 seconds has been my... Um, my personal best. Well, anyway, keeping to the topic of uh, droopy eyelids, we might end up with something like this. The um, the edge of the eye hole is somewhat rounded. So you might want to keep that in mind. Do not not make it too blocky. So, um, thinking of just an eye, what do we have here? We have the tear glands, then we usually have um, a bit of curvature. You can um, abstract the upper curvature into three, like this. I think that uh, usually works fairly well. And then you can abstract the lower curvature into two, like this. I think that, that also often works well. Then, of course, you have the, um, the pupil here. We're not getting to that yet. Then you have the um, the upper eyelid, and you might have the droopy bit here. So what we have draw drawn up until now is this bit here. We are done with this. Uh, now we want to get into the eyelid itself. So it comes down somewhere around here. And uh, similarly on the other side, it will be uh, much less visible because of because the um, the nose is in the way. So after that, we have the open position of the eye. Let's abstract this with um, three planes. However, the way that I have drawn it here, part of it will be obscured by the droopy eyelid which is exactly as it was uh, for the model, as I recall. Then, relatively a flat line like this, and some more here. The Ruby eyelids can be something that um, is quite useful for drawing imaginary characters as well, even for some uh, cute waifus. Although, of course, it is uh, a bit more unusual for them. Now, new viewers, please do not be spooked. I'm going to take a look at my gesture drawing, which is uh, not particularly attractive. I have to remember in which direction this person is supposed to be looking at. And it is um, a bit left of her center line. So, we might want our... I to be positioned something like like this. We can work work on that later if we want to. So there we mostly have the eyes. The next one might be the eyebrows. She was doing a bit of a, a scrunch here. Let's take a look at it again. Yes. Some of her frontal bone might be showing. The frontal bone or the um, the forehead bone, in more English, is the bone that uh, sits around here. This is um, perhaps the most robust bone uh, in the human body. If you headbutt someone, you hit uh, hit them with this bone. However, this is generally not 
that discipline for women. So I think we have some of it being visible, but mostly this is going to be down to the eyebrows. The eyebrows themselves, in a neutral position, they sit above the um, on the brow ridge. But uh, this person is not making a neutral face. She might be pulling them down a little bit. So, ah, excuse me. I think I want to use red again, so it contrasts a little bit with the uh, the droopy eyelid part here. But actually, want something more, uh, more like this. And the other one was uh, slightly more straight, I believe. This is going to end up being more of an inspired by um, drawing than a uh, an anatomic tracing of the original picture. And she had some. Brows here that can be can be quite difficult to draw actually from imagination. Uh, scrunched and um, drooping meat is kind of like clothes in the in the sense that you really have to think about what is moving if you want to um, intellectually draw the result of the movement. So we have. What actually do we have? Stage left, she is pulling it um, a bit down and I think inside. Whereas on the other side, she is more pulling it inside. So we have um, a contact, something like this. And we might, might want to add these kind of traces at the start and the beginning. At the start and the end, so that it ends up looking more, more like it uh, comes from somewhere. That's probably fine for now. Um, I think then we want to move on into the mouth. The mouth is, uh, particularly when it comes to lips, quite a difficult one. Uh, we know that some of her upper teeth will be visible. I think her canines on both sides were visible. They're going to be around uh, around here. And then she is going to have four teeth between there. And some of her bottom teeth will be visible as well. So those, those will be much more difficult for me to draw. Because it is a bit of an extreme angle. Turn back the opacity on these, and then let's get into the lips. Again, if we think about the lips in ideal, um, you can basically think of them in uh, three sections on the top and two sections on the bottom. Uh, you have the field room, uh, below the, where the nose attaches, and to the Uh, this is the front plane of the upper lip. So after this, you actually have the lip itself. The mass here is um, roughly part shaped. And then you have masses on both sides of this. Whereas on the bottom you have um, basically two masses. Just drawing them like this, of course, doesn't make it look like lips. So you have to find some uh, a suitable level of abstraction for it. Let's try to find that now. Let's draw in the um, the lips. I think she was. She has this, this side is pulled up, this side is relatively normal. 
because it's actually uh, with the movement it's uh, going to be much more difficult than actually just throwing the lips um the edge of the lips is going to be around the middle of the um the person's eye so she is on this side it's going to be it's going to end up somewhere around here but on this side it would be here but she is pulling it so it ends perhaps it ends up being um, around there at this point we then need to have a, um, a mass let's try to give it some volume with some cross hatching and the opposite On this side, I think we're going to have to. Um, we're going to end up moving something. Probably the teeth. Hmm. Ah yes, not much of a problem. I just had the uh, the teeth thrown in a little bit high. I think so around here, around here like this and of course the bottom lips is going to be are going to be around here and uh, pulled into a curve here as well This is turning into a bit of a, a different facial expression than this uh, individual actually had, but uh, good enough for me. We are running two hours now. Anyway. Uh, and I am going to add in some vestiges of teeth between here. They are not going to be as visible as they were on the actual model, but uh, tough luck. Now, I am going to start thinking about the knee. So if she has pulled her cheek out, uh, she is also going to move some meat around here. So you end up with something uh, like this, and then back into the, uh, into the actual bone here. There won't be nearly as much uh, movement on this side. There's a bit of a trace here. There will be a bit of a trace like this. Again, um, please note the meat moving. You get a kind of a, a kind of a plane here. For shading purposes, the uh, front plane of the eye socket might be interesting. So we're probably going to have a different shade here in the in the eye socket than outside. And then the cheekbone from somewhere around here the um, the ears you start a new a new, new layer for it once again let's start start with just imagining a flat plane along the skull Damn, I never figured colors are helpful for anatomy instead of dying everything black. Uh, this is a good observation. Actually, um, when I've been studying um, anatomy, I have actually used up to four or five colors as well. So, um, blue, red, green, yellow, or brownish, and black. It uh, really helps you differentiate between them. Um, so the ears, the both the top and the bottom part of the ear stick up from the skull, but uh, to different, slightly different amounts. Let's um, let's draw them sticking out the same amount first, so we can imagine we have this um, kind of like a ramp here. So this would be the volume of our ear. However, 
the thing is that uh, the bottom actually does not stick out that much. So I'm going to halve this side. And then I am going to change the outer bounding box here so that it curves down here. So that's um, that's roughly the bounding box of the eye um, of the ear that we want. The next part is actually throwing in the features of the ear, which is of course three dimensional. So you might want to throw something um, that follows the bounding box because at the at the bottom you want it uh, turning back as the ear has a sort of um, question mark uh, form to it and at the top you might want something that follows the um the top curve of the ear and at this point, you just have to start adding in detail. You can either look at photos of the ear. They can be quite complicated. But um, perhaps the most important part is around here. There is this um, knob of the ear that turns, turns something like this. When you're done with that, this is a sort of... Um, double curve kind of um, question mark shape perhaps then if you are not um, making a huge effort like I'm not going to do now you might just uh, draw something up here like uh, maybe a Y or something the internal structure of the ear is uh, going to vary from person to person anyway so it's not that uh, critical And there we have the ear. And then uh, let's turn the opacity down a little bit here and start a new group. This is going to be a group for the for the hair. The second helping line was the hairline. So uh, this person actually had her um, hair pulled back. So. Her entire hairline will be visible. This is not necessarily the case for um, other people. It can be helpful to draw in the hairline so that you have a vague idea where you want to draw um, hair starting at. And then the difficult part begins. Um, I actually like to use a specific brush for this. What I use is my multiple pencils brush. If you look at my uh, art assets, you will notice that they are mostly drawn in this brush. It's um, supposed to be like a bundle of, um, of pencil, colored pencils together. And with this, um, I like to start. Actually, let's turn it back on. How does where does her hair go? I think it's just uh, pulled straight straight back. Let's do the same. So we have you know beginning points, and then you want to think about where the um, in which direction the hair is going, where it is going to end up. This can actually be something that um, actually let's let's go back to the um, the chalk one. It might be easier for you to follow, and easier for me to follow in um, follow afterwards as well. Larger than I want it. Right, this is fine. Sort of um, start abstracting the hair. You might uh, think of you know, um, very abstract cartoon characters or perhaps um, you know 3D animation characters. They by necessity or al usually also have um, kind of polygonal abstracted hairs. 
he probably has some kind of um bun at the back of her, her head let's uh let's not look it up again but uh, the hair is is going to follow the contours of her skull and end up somewhere around there so this is uh something that we can use as our guideline for how the hair is going to going to act of course the uh, the parts that run behind her skull are not going to be relevant for the uh, finished drawing but uh, as always it's uh, it's more useful to draw things that you cannot see and just not ink them at the end than trying to just make things up i always recommend going through more effort than you absolutely need and then erasing some at the end of course if you are in a hurry if you for example want to be a, uh, a commercial artist taking commissions for example you have to think about how much time you want to spend for each project this might uh, not be connected with the uh, might be connected with the amount of money you are taking per project or even if you are a hobbyist uh, how much effort you are willing to put into one project uh, this is something that I should really think more about myself when starting projects. I have a, um, a nasty habit of um, starting huge projects that I never manage to actually finish. So where does her head go? It goes behind her head, as I suspected. What it does behind there, I don't know. I'm just going to sort of sort of give her a um, sort of a ponytail here just to have a bit of a, a longer hair it's always difficult to make um, it takes more skill to draw someone in detail and keep them looking feminine than it does uh, removing detail to make them look feminine um i'm going to ink this a couple of times once is going to be yes this is a um brush that i want to use one is going to be um relatively realistic but the next one is going to be i'm going to use the same construction but I'm going to try to make it um, more stylized, more waifu-ish, so that the proportions are still there, but only a part of the outlines are drawn so that it looks more, you know, cartoonish. Let's have a go at it. So, on this go around, we are going to ink the entire outside outline of the nose. And a part of the nostril. 
some of the inside outline, as I recall, her having a uh, relatively distinct um, cartilage in her nose. I am going to add the um, ear gland here. It's probably going to end up looking like a granny, honestly. That's, um, that's the struggle of drawing young people in relatively high detail. I'm actually going to go all out and I am going to try to draw in the, um, the plane of the eyelid here. Of course, the eyelid is a three-dimensional object as well and um, has its own volume so from certain angles you will be able to see this uh, strip of flesh um, this one on the um, on the eyelids they exist although they are quite small Uh, the brushes have reset. I'm not going to draw in uh, these parts of the skull just yet. I might draw, draw them at the end if I want to. You might not want to try the try, uh, draw the um, outside outline of the lips really under any circumstances. That's um, that's a fast track to uh, symbolic drawing. Like you know, if a child is going to draw lips, they are going to draw them like this. That doesn't really look good in under any circumstances. Uh, Wanzel, hello. Um, thank you. I, uh, unfortunately, a lot of uh, art streamers or people who sell their um, working, their works in progress, so their PSDs, for example, aren't that um, structured about it. So I have tried um, doing some industrial espionage towards a number of online artists that I enjoy, but unfortunately it isn't very helpful. So I hope that this kind of uh, method, very methodical um, presentation will be helpful for some of you. Then the inside of the... lower lip, that's actually that's looking quite, quite nice actually now i am going to try to show some of the teeth here no i'm doing a bad job with this teeth tooth she is now looking atrociously like a granny i'm going to Turn this into its own layer grow, and then I can use another layer for the teeth. So I can just um, erase them as I want to, if I want to, which is uh, honestly the ideal case. Right, so that turned out uh, relatively well. Let's add a bit of uh, chin line here. 
and then let's move on into the ears curve here again and then let's just take these two lines i think it'll be good enough i think then we have the uh, the neckline the other neckline all right so um let's check out how this ended up I am still missing the, uh, the irises. Let's add those in so that. Uh, doesn't look quite that uh, go ghastly. Looks like. All right, so this is how it ended up, just as, uh, as line work. I'd say I'm halfway satisfied with this. It's uh, certainly I would describe this as expressive. Um, it doesn't really look like a young woman. You might uh, easily inter interpret this as uh, a feminine man or an older woman. Again, drawing young women particularly is quite difficult when you want to be uh, detailed about it. So instead of being detailed about it uh, what happens if we use the same sketch but uh, only ink quite selectively let's have a look of course when you're doing waifus you probably want to give them large eyes as well so that's going to be uh, a bit of a difference between these uh, so between these uh, demonstrations and how you would probably actually be drawing in your uh, hobby activities fitting actual anatomy and the kind of uh, exaggerated uh, proportions together is uh, is quite difficult um, for example i once started on a drawing of um, a certain artistically minded minded youtuber who in her uh, character design has quite um quite a thin neck and quite a large head as uh, Japanese styled cartoon characters often do. And fitting everything together turned out uh, to be actually quite difficult. So here I am doing basically what um, Yoshikazu something uh, keeps on doing. So he is thinking about what's happening but uh, making a conscious effort not to draw what should be there and instead what he wants to be visible i think the lips actually ended up being quite um, quite nice even in the first one so let's not make massive changes there but um, What else do we want? The chin here doesn't have to be quite so, uh, let's say, robust, realistic. We can uh, take a bit of a short shortcut here across the actual bone. That's going to make her look uh, look and feel more feminine. Instead of uh, drawing in the entire curve of the eyelid here, let's just uh, draw in points. Uh, the frontal bone we don't want that at all and we might in fact 
want something um, quite stylized on the uh, bro paro here, instead of even making an effort um, of following what the actual structure would be like. So then we likely want a um, an extra exaggeratedly uh, thin but long um, eyebrow. And let's um, the other one kind of let's say usual curv curvature. Well, that's not, not not looking quite right. I'm going to follow the um, the sketch a little bit more. I think that's uh, that's going to be fine. So then we might want to uh, um, draw the strands that um, leave here as more massive than they actually are. In the previous one, I drew this area as uh, just um, very short, very gracile lines. Here we might want to um, suggest larger masses moving without actually um, really throwing them in. And the ear. And probably round out the ear a little bit more. Not put that much uh, much detail into it in general. Mm, probably not draw in the um, the neck tendons. I don't think. Uh, probably don't want uh, to draw them in for the kind of purposes that I imagine new people will. Uh, mostly want to draw for. Uh, and then the eye might want to exaggerate the uh, size of the pupils a little bit. When I say a little bit, I mean uh, make them like double the size. That's uh, probably fine for something that is still cartoonish, but uh, not absurdly so. Think of something like um, Overwatch characters, for example. Let's uh, take a look at this point. What does this look like without the sketch? Uh, there is definitely something missing here. This is uh, not looking all that good. So what do we actually want to add here? Put in some black for the um, eyebrows. Add some um, volume to the hair. It's an interesting effect that I um, I did not notice before. Although there was uh, almost no detail to the hair in the first uh, inking round, I thought it. It looked much much better than it did with this one. Probably something to do with the uh, the general level of detail. So well, it somehow fit better having a, a small amount of detail for the hair when its outlines were more detailed. I think this line here is particularly successful. Let's try curving it the other way around. That might look better. So the nose didn't quite work. Let's um let's just start it higher up. We need um
we do need some amount of structure here. Mm, with these proportions, something um, extremely simple is not going to work. I don't think this is quite a success either. It's it's closer than the previous installment was. Let's try to um, add some teeth here again. Maybe a hint of an outline for the lips. Not there. I think that's uh, counterproductive. Having a bit of definition on the lower lip uh, might help. Yeah, definitely looks better. I think we actually do need the um, the neck tendon on the uh, stage right side. And I think this is where we get into trouble with this uh, juggling between actually realistic proportions and uh, keeping it quite stylized. Let's add, uh, add a bit bit of an outline here, maybe a bit here, and I think at this point what we actually have to start doing is fiddling with the proportions. So I am going to take both of the eyes and um, Cut the selections to new layers. And what that means is that I will be able to resize the eyes at will without actually impacting anything else. Here we are. So, let's say we just try out plane making, making, make, make it bigger. Does this end up looking any better? It doesn't seem like that at the start, but uh, let's just do it and see how it, how it turns out. Honest, honestly, not. It's just this ending up uh, looking more and more creepy. Let's roll this back. I don't like looking at it. Instead, um, let's turn down the opacity on these on the um, existing eyes and um, just drawing a drawing a, a simpler eye. Not uh, not quite this small. A bit uh, larger. Let's say let's use the um, the Ray curve idea again, something like uh, I think I want to have a ray curve here actually because of the whole uh, droopy eyes idea. Although it might be the droopy eyes that are making her look creepy in this uh, level of detail. Oh, some uh, stylized. Um, Eyelashes here might help. And of course, the um, underside of the eye will be lower than it actually would be as well. And then give her some of those big, big wife for eyes. I'm going to leave in some um, some white at the top because she ended up looking so creepy that I think the uh, the creepiness is part of my. Uh, 
vision for this uh, character design at this point. Let's um, turn off the uh, old eyes. Oh. Uh, this might be something that we would end up with. Um, looks fine to me. I mean, um, aesthetically, this isn't something that I um, I would be particularly proud of, but uh, it works. And um, as a demonstration of using actual um, Actual proportions to a structure you're drawing of a uh, more stylized character seems uh, seems to make sense to me. And as I expected, it has taken quite a while to work on the um, the face. I had planned uh, for the feet gesture session, but uh, I don't think I will be getting into that. We are now two and a half hours into this. And uh, I think I'm done. Thanks to everyone for attending. Thank you to everyone um, attending afterwards on YouTube as I am closing the recording now.